Welcome everybody to the fourth annual Quest Summer Research Conference. Again, thank you everyone for bearing with us. Are we waiting for the music? Is that what you were stopping, Michelle? I, was in, I just wanted to make sure. But um, yes, thank you and welcome to our conference. And we're really excited for all of you to be here with us. We're excited to be here. And um, you know, before we get started with our presentations, we just want to go through our agenda. So we know that we've taken up some of your time already. So we're gonna we're gonna get go through this pretty quickly. Um, here are some Zoom logistics. As you can see, we've already had some issues with Zoom. So hopefully, we will no longer have any more issues with Zoom. Um, but just so you know, um, just please stay muted during. The, all the presentations and even later on when you go into breakout rooms with um, each one of our present presenters, please also keep yourself on mute unless you're asking a question or you're interacting with the presenter. Um, we're going to enable live transcript for closed captioning. Um, please put your thoughts, reactions, um, you know, your encouragements in the chat, you know, for our presenters during their presentations. They want to hear it, we want to hear it. Um, and please also remember to keep your questions until the end. So once we are done with presentations, we are going to post um, links to breakout rooms and each one of you will be, be able to choose which breakout room you want to go into. And you don't have to stay in that one breakout room. You'll be able to move between rooms and talk to the presenters, ask questions, learn more about their posters. Okay, so if you get disconnected for some reason, just log right back on. Right, and if you're having difficulty, um, Ellis was on before, I'm not sure if she's staying on, but you can also email her um, at ent1 at nyu.edu. So let's talk a minute about what Quest is. Um, just for those of you who don't know anything about the program, um, and this is the first time you're coming to this conference, uh, so Quest is an eight week PhD pipeline program for students of color. It's housed in our wonderful Department of Applied Psychology in the School of Steinhardt. Um, and it's where students have the opportunity to do research um, and with amazing NYU faculty. And they also are supervised by graduate student mentors. So what's the purpose of the program? The aim of the program is to assist in the development of skills necessary to get into doctoral programs and to provide career socialization experiences for the students. So as part of this experience, students attend professional development classes during the week, and they also work on research projects. So in addition, they also aid our faculty in, um, in their research and they develop their own work. So some students today have developed proposals, some students have analyzed data, and you're gonna get to see this work today. So here are just some fun stats and some fun info about our, our, quest, our current Quest students. Um, they come from a variety of schools, such as Bard College in New York, Staten Island Technical High School, McMaster University, Alcorn State University, CUNY Lehman College, Skidmore College, Georgetown University, University of California, Santa Barbara, Hunter College, Goucher College, CUNY John Jay, and Swarthmore College. They also come from a variety of cities all over the United States and Canada, such as Carlisle, Massachusetts, Staten Island, New York, Oakville, Ontario, Orlando, Florida, Yonkers, New York, Hinesburg, Vermont, Morrisville, North Carolina, uh, National City, California, uh, Middletown, New York, Boston, Massachusetts, Brooklyn, New York, and South Richmond Hill, New York. So before we begin our presentations, of course, we've got to give special thanks to all of the folks who have really helped and supported the Quest program. Um, we want to give a very special thanks to Dr. LaRue Allen. She is the Dean, the Vice Dean for Faculty Affairs at NYU Steinhardt School of Culture and Education and Human Development. She birthed the Quest program and continues to support the Quest mission. Um, a special shout out to all of our Quest program operators. Um, so Amanda Holda, who is the social media lead, Anna Cronenberg, who is the program assistant, Narissa Williams, who's the mentor lead, Yami, Yami Pentel, who is the program assistant, 
and Jordan Morris, who's the showrunner, and Michelle Vardanian, who is our curriculum coordinator. Um, as you know, Jordan and Michelle work closely with the students every week and have done an amazing job this summer in supporting in supporting our Quest students. So of course, we also have to give a very special thank you to all of our PIs, those doctors Elisa Capella, Natalie Brito, William Sai, Barry Cohen, Anil Chaco, Aaron Godfrey, Shabnam Jadani, Joshua Aronson. And of course, our Quest mentors are our graduate students who are there for our Quest students, helping them along the way. Um, and that is Quenisha Critchlow, Jen Ank, Dina Ibram, Jessica Siegel, Victoria Monti, Brittany Matthews, Diana Malav, and Sarah Vogel. And a special thank you to all the folks that lectured over the summer months, over the last couple of weeks. And I just want to give, you know, just say that I was lucky enough to be the the social justice lead for the Quest program, and I got to meet with the Quest students several times um, to discuss social justice issues within academia, um, learn about their intersectional identities, and their critical analysis of social and political issues related to psychology and their own lived experiences. So that's a little bit about the Quest program. That's our thank yous, and now we can now get on with our presentations, what we've all been waiting for. So I'm gonna turn it over to our first presenter, Iris Mann. Thank you so much, Dr. Moore. Um, and thank you all for your patience and for the amazing Quest team to get us here through those technical issues. I really appreciate it. Um, my name is Iris Mann. I'm in the FACES lab working under Brittany Matthews and Dr. Anil Chaco. Today, I will be presenting a proposal highlighting the impact of cultural assessment on trauma-informed care within racial and ethnic minoritized youth. Experiences of trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, are widespread and have been identified as a public health crisis. Within this national crisis, disparities emerge. Ethnic and racial minoritized individuals experience higher rates of PTSD compared to white Americans. Clinical science must be intentional in noting the role that racial and ethnic identities play in experiencing trauma, access to treatment, and the efficacy of these treatments. This proposal highlights that a potential way for the field to tailor to the needs of these clients is through evidence-based trauma-informed therapies like trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy or TFCBT, and also through adding a cultural assessment. The cultural assessment that we will be utilizing is the Wright Constantine Structured Culture Interview, also known as the WICSI, which is based off of Dr. Pamela Hayes' addressing framework. This model assesses client identities and pushes clinicians to reflect on their own social location. This proposal utilizes a randomized control trial study design. We intend to recruit 75 participants between the ages of 14 to 19 who all identify as race, racial or ethnic minoritized youth. 25 participants will be randomly assigned to either a weightless control condition, 16 sessions of TFCBT, or cultural assessment prior to the 16 sessions of TFCBT. We will be measuring PTSD symptomology and client patient trust and respect pre, post, and follow-up intervention. We expect that the participants in the TFCBT and cultural assessment condition will have a greater decrease in PTSD symptom severity and frequency. We also expect that participants in the TFCBT and cultural assessment condition will have greater clinician client trust and respect scores. This work is important because it is the first RCT to assess cultural assessment in the context of trauma-informed care within racial and ethnic minoritized youth. The study detailed in this proposal would help to inform treatment and suggest further research into effective interventions for individuals who hold identities more at risk of experiencing trauma and developing PTSD based on systemic inequities. While racial trauma is becoming more recognized within clinical literature, it is important to note that all incidents of trauma are racialized, not just incidents categorized as racial trauma, and we want to see this reflected in all clinical and counseling literature. Thank you so much for your time. I would like to extend a huge thank you to Brittany Matthews, Michelle Vardanian, Dr. Emil Chaco, and the rest of the amazing Quest faculty and cohort. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Iris. That was great. Thank you. Next up, we have Angelica Vasquez. Okay. 
Good morning, everyone. My name is Angel Vasquez. I'm also working under the FACES lab with the guidance of Brittany Matthews and Dr. Anil Chaco. My research proposal today aims to describe how parental ADHD affects parenting quality. Adult ADHD affects around 4% of the United States. However, it is likely that this, this is an inaccurate statistic as adults with ADHD tend to find ways to work around their symptoms rather than seek diagnosis and treatment. This can be seen by adults with ADHD being overrepresented in certain professions as well as experiencing higher rates of unemployment. While adult ADHD has several consequences for the affected person, we must also take into consideration that most adults will become parents in their lifetime. Additionally, it is well documented that parents who care for children with ADHD have heightened levels of parental stress. Yet, there are a few studies that have aimed to capture how specific subtypes or subclinical ADHD presentations affect parenting style. Therefore, this study aims to achieve this as well as to include both parent and child perspectives of parenting quality. This study will include three measures, the ASRS, which will determine parents' ADHD status and subtype, qualitative interviews that will record accounts of parenting and childhood experiences with ADHD, and the MAPS, which will rate parenting dimensions and quality. As you can see in the center, MAPS will measure parents on seven dimensions of parenting along two axes, warmth versus hostility and autonomy versus control. The study will include 200 parent and child participants. Parents will undergo all measures while children will only participate in the MAPS in order to double score parenting measures. Additionally, only a subset of the sample will be, be invited for the qualitative interviews. Based on the results of previous studies, it is expected that parents with ADHD will perform more negative parenting practices and fewer positive parenting practices. Additionally, certain parental ADHD subtypes will be associated with the use of specific negative parenting practices. Specifically, inattentive parents will rely more on lack of control while hyperactive parents will be more likely to use physical control and hostility. Finally, the results of the study will help to point out any differences in parenting quality between different ADHD subtypes and those without ADHD. This will also help to contribute towards any future interventions that can improve parenting skills for parents with ADHD and can be personalized for their subtype specific weaknesses. I just want to say thank you to Brittany Matthews, Michelle Vardanian, and Dr. Chaco for their guidance throughout the project. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angel. Great work. Next up, we have Gabrielle Orteco. Um, good morning, everyone. My, hi, my name is Gabrielle Orteco, and I'm a part of the Island Lab. Our proposed study focuses on how the severity of postpartum depression affects the degree of parental intrusiveness that occurs during the parent-child relationship. Globally, about 10 to 13% of women who have given birth or who are pregnant have suffered from a mental disorder, most commonly depression. Postpartum depression is a form of major depressive disorder that occurs one month after childbirth. Postpartum depression is associated with negative parenting behaviors such as parental intrusiveness. Parental intrusiveness is displayed by parents who overstimulate their children during the parent-child interactions. This demand for control can put a strain on the parent-child relationship, which may subsequently impact children's mental health. In this study, we aim to study how does the severity of postpartum depression affect the degree of parental intrusiveness that to occur in the parent-child interaction. We hypothesized that postpartum depression will be associated with greater levels of parental intrusiveness. Our participants will consist of 130 infants at three months of age enrolled with their mothers, and they will all be recruited around the metropolitan area. The measures we, be, will, be, we will be using are the still-based paradigm and the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale. The Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale identifies whether a mother has common symptoms of postpartum depression between the start of pregnancy to the end of the following, following the birth. The still-faced paradigm identifies infant's capacity for self-regulation during interactions that interrupt typical patterns of reciprocity between infants and their mothers. The study will begin with mothers taking a demographic and EPDS questionnaire and then, and then each segment of the self-based paradigm will be conducted and recorded. After this reunion phase of the paradigm will then be recorded by two coders to identify the extent of parental intrusiveness that had occurred. 
The expectation is that high levels of parental intrusiveness, intrusiveness will occur during the junior phase of the still phase paradigm among mothers suffering from symptoms of postpartum depression. Previous research supports that postpartum depression hinders child development. Postpartum depression has links to parental intrusiveness, which may lead to children experiencing mental health issues during such as separation anxiety in later years. Studies such as this highlights the importance of understanding the effects parental psychiatric disorders have on their infant's social and emotional functioning. Future research should continue to examine the ways postpartum depression influences parenting, altering the cognitive development of children in longitudinal studies. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Gabby. Next up, we have Ayamidi Popola. Hello, everyone. My name is Ayomidi Papula, and I am part of the Island Lab under the su supervision of Dr. Natalie Brito and Sarah Vogel. Today, we will be looking at the associations between experiences of obstetric racism and adverse health outcomes in Black mother infant dyads. Literature has shown that Black mothers in the United States are at higher risk of experiencing complications than any other racial group pre, during, and post pregnancy. Black women are also more likely to perceive experiencing racial discrimination in these obstetric environments known as obstetric racism. As one can imagine, racism of any kind can have a detrimental impact on an individual's mental health. With that being said, maternal mental health has been subsequently associated with differences in the infant stress hormone cortisol. The importance of all these findings stems from the fact that Black infants are more likely to show patterns of cortisol dysregulation starting in early infancy. These findings together suggest that there may be an intergenerational link between maternal experiences of obstetric racism and infant stress physiology. However, however, no literature to our knowledge has directly investigated this. So our study aims to investigate how maternal mental health during the perinatal period acts as a mediator between experiences of obstetric racism in Black mothers and elevated cortisol levels in Black infants. Based on the literature in this field, we expect that experiences of obstetric racism will be associated with elevated infant cortisol levels, and this relationship will then be mediated by maternal mental health. To carry out the proposed study, we will employ a mixed methods longitudinal design with a participant pool of 100 pregnant women carrying their first child to term, residing in one of the five boroughs of New York City. All participants of the study must identify as African-American or Black, including Afro-Caribbean and Black African. The study will consist of a pre-study demographic questionnaire and three study waves occurring at one month three months and nine months postpartum. Wave one will consist of a semi-structured qualitative interview to capture individual experiences of obstetric care and racism in new black mothers. Wave two will include two measures of maternal mental health, the Edinburgh postnatal depression scale and the perceived stress scale. At wave three, hair samples will be collected from each infant to assess cumulative hair cortisol levels. To evaluate interview data, we plan on conducting a content analysis to capture how Black mothers characterize their own experiences of obstetric care and racism. Within the quantitative data, we will test a mediation model of obstetric racism as a predictor, maternal mental health as a mediator, and infant cortisol levels as the outcome. It is anticipated that our results will reflect that experiences of obstetric racism will be associated with poor maternal mental health and subsequently elevated infant cortisol levels. Additionally, maternal mental health will mediate the relationship between obstetric racism in black mothers and black infant cortisol levels. This study has the potential to highlight the impacts of obstetric racism on black mothers' mental health and black infant stress physiology. As we leave here today, I urge you to consider this research as a call to action in psychology to amplify marginalized communities' voices while advocating and creating sustainable change on a systemic level to lessen health disparities within these populations. Thank you for your time. Great work, Io. Thank you so much. Next up, we have Elena, Elena Kwan. 
Hi, my name is Elena and I am working with the Culture, Emotion and Health Lab with Dr. William Tsai and Victoria Monti. Family caregivers who look after those with geriatric diseases or terminal illnesses may experience emotional distress, specifically caregiver burden during the support giving process. Previous literature on caregiving has shown that the motivation expressed by the caregiver may have an impact on the individual's mental state and ability to cope with challenges. Among some Asian Americans, East Asians, and Southeast Asians, filial piety or obligation to family can be an important social value and motivation in caregiving. However, filial piety may exacerbate the level of caregiver burden among Asian Americans as they reside in an individualist culture, but are of a collectivist family background. Additionally, how the motivation is experienced by the individual may also play a role in the level of caregiver burden. The motivation of filial piety may further be influenced by the type of motivation. For example, the motivation may be integrated, which is when the person fully accepts the social value and volitionally engages in it. Conversely, if the motivation is interjected, meaning the person has difficulty re reconciling social values with their self values, the person may experience greater caregiver burden. Therefore, the current proposed study attempts to examine the relationship between the motivation of filial piety and caregiver burden and whether cultural orientation may play a role. Study participants will be recruited from both in-person and online caregiver support groups from the US and China. Individuals will be eligible for the study if they are Asian American or are East and or Southeast Asian residing in China. Additionally, caregivers must cite obligation to family as a motivation for caregiving in the initial screening process. Once determined as eligible, participants will undergo a semi-structured interview to determine whether their motivation is interjected or integrated. Examples of interview questions include how participants motivate themselves to continue caregiving during adverse situations and what the caregiving experience means to them. Following the interview, the participants will then complete the caregiver burden inventory to assess their level of burden. Interviews will then be coded as interjected or integrated based on recurring statements of either engagement with filial piety out of social approval or disapproval or out of self-fulfillment. It is expected that individuals with interjected motivation will have greater caregiver burden than those with integrated motivation. Individualistic persons are also expected to have higher levels of caregiver burden in comparison to collectivist persons. Finally, those from individualistic cultures and with interjected motivation are expected to have the highest level of caregiver burden among all other participants. This proposed study is among the few that attempts to examine the association between motivation and caregiver burden using qualitative and quantitative methods. However, this study is limited in its generalizability because it is only able to examine a single motivational reason and two cultural groups. Despite its shortcomings, this study can offer insight into future motivational interventions for caregivers and the extent to which culture may have an impact on the level of caregiver burden. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Elena, great work. Now introducing Rihanna, Rihanna McPhee. Good morning, my name is Rihanna McPhee. I worked in the Culture and Motion Health Lab with Dr. William Tsai and my mentor, Jen. I'll be talking about critical consciousness and racial colorblindness among black and white biracial individuals. Multiracial identity integration, often defined as how well a person integrates the multiracial identities and is often dependent on parental racial socialization, which is a practice to teach those children about race, racism, and culture. And parental racial socialization can be a unique process for this black, white, biracial population due to their interracial family structure and parents' different racial experiences coming from oppressed and oppressor. And having high parental racial socialization is also linked to low colorblindness, which can relate to high academic achievement, persistence in college, and life satisfaction. And my apologies, um, which is related to um, lower critical consciousness related to high academic achievement, persistent college and life satisfaction. On the other hand, having higher colorblindness related to mental health, lower mental health and identity development and integration. Hence, I am proposing my question, are black, white, biracial first year college students at risk of having high colorblindness and low critical consciousness due to their racial, the conflicting racial identities and associated parental racial socialization? I hypothesize that as having 
um, as this bush population will have high current racial socialization, it will lead to higher multiracial identity integration and high critical consciousness, low colorblindness. I'll be recruiting 250 black, white, biracial first year CUNY undergraduate students through online listers and on-campus flyers during their first semester. Specifically, first semester um, first year college students will be selected since we want to look at these variables before they may receive classes that foster critical consciousness. consciousness. And they will be taking the colorblind racial attitude skill, multiracial identity integration skill, critical consciousness skill, and culture and racial experience of socialization skill, which will be available online using Qualtrics. And all these collected data will be analyzed using correlational analysis on SBSS. I hypothesize that black, white, biracial individuals who score high on parental racial socialization will also score high on multiracial identity integration. And multiracial identity integration will have a positive correlation with critical consciousness, consciousness while having a low, uh, my apologies, negative correlation with colorblindness. If the hypothesis are supported, it could mean that possibly mean that biracial college students who have a high co combined racial identity may have the ability to acknowledge and battle racism, may persist and show resilience at the face of negative racial encounters and protect their mental health while being comfortable with their identity. And this study is the first to look at all these variables together, additionally within bi uh, biracial populations who identify as black and white. This could possibly help create interventions for colorblindness in academic or household settings for parents. However, this does not provide contextual details, which would be more helpful for parents and counselors who may be walking, working with this population. Additionally, because of location, age group, and socioeconomic status, um, this result can be altered, making it difficult to generalize for this population. And lastly, I would give, like to give a huge thanks to the program for allowing me to build this um, research, my uh, mentor, my PI, and everyone involved in the program throughout the last two months. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Renina. Great work. Next up, we have Jashiel Ball. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jashelle Ball, and I worked in the RISE Lab under doctors Aaron Godfrey and Shabnam Jagdani and mentor Deanna Ibrahim. Today, I'd first like you to think back to your middle and high schools and its social context during those times. Some of you may have positive memories where the dynamics of your context were all great. Others, maybe not so much, but overall, you'd probably say that they did play a role in who you are today. And this is especially the case for urban youth with heavy police presence in their communities. For them, these social contexts contribute to their academic and long-term outcomes, such as high school dropout and arrest rates. However, they develop aspects of the self that serve as either protective or risk factors in these outcomes, specifically self-efficacy and sense of school belonging. But these two aspects of the individual are also shaped by contextual factors as well, like a two-way street where your individual driving shapes the road or context for the driver going the other way and vice versa. Therefore, taking an ecological approach that recognizes the context in girls' individual experiences, this study examined the relationships between justice system context, self-efficacy, and sense of school belonging for Black girls. And for me, looking at Black girls specifically was important, given that most research in this area disregards them as a uniquely marginalized population in regards to their race and gender. And this is alarming, since Black girls are six times more likely to be referred to police for arrest in school. The study consisted of 168 participants ranging in age from 11 to 18 years old in grades 6 through 12, and reported moderate levels of self-efficacy in school belonging. For this particular study, I conducted a mediation analysis to test whether system contact, such as experiences with arrest and probation, is associated with self-efficacy as well as whether sense of school belonging mediates or explains this association between justice system contact and self-efficacy. Overall, I did not find an association between justice system contact and self-efficacy and could not test for full mediation. But when adjusting for age and grade level, there was a marginally significant association between system contact and sense of school belonging. There was also a marginally significant association between school year and self-efficacy. And these results were relevant since the majority of the sample were in the ninth and 10th grades. This in fact goes back to the idea of the context and the individual being connected 
as the ninth and 10th grades are important transitional years for youth. During this time, youth rely heavily on their social context to build relationships and understandings of the self, others, and the world that help them navigate the context they're in. So for girls with these intersectional social identities, the dynamics of their school context could play an important role in developing the individual, which again affects long-term outcomes. However, this study was limited to its small sample size and lack of examining what specific factors, such as student-faculty relationships, contribute to self-efficacy and sense of school belonging. Future research should address these limitations. Thus, policymakers could have the evidence to develop and implement more inclusive strategies in school that address the interconnectedness between social context and individuals in order to promote more positive academic and long-term outcomes desired. Thank you. Thank you, Jashal. Great work. Next up, we have Kayla Perez. Hello, my name is Kayla Perez. I am part of the RISE Lab with Dr. Javdani and Dr. Godfrey, with Diana as my mentor. My research proposal is on adultification, which is when adults view children as miniature adults. Children are expected to know right from wrong, over-sexualized, and are not given the equal opportunity to have an innocent childhood. My focus will be on the effects of adultification in schools and the juvenile justice system. The reason for this focus is to show how Black girls are victims of adultification bias and are overpunished in schools. For example, black girls may be over-sexualized resulting in dress code violations and other infractions in schools. Black girls are also overpunished in the juvenile justice system by experiencing higher school arrests. Black feminist theory would help examine how black girls who are outspoken are viewed as loud and aggressive, but white girls are viewed as being feminist. The participants in the study will include 600 black and white sixth grade girls that will be examined so they're in their 12th grade. First, an email will be sent out to principals of 15 schools in Brooklyn and the Bronx about the reason and importance of this study. Schools in the Bronx and Brooklyn will be chosen because in 2018, they had the highest arrest rates for 16 year olds. Guidance counselors will be advised to give the survey at the end of their sixth grade school year when they're doing their hour session with their students. These participants will take their survey so they're in their 12th grade year, so we're able to examine their responses every year. The survey has seven items that are adapted from the golf innocence scale to measure if both black and white girls have been victims of adultification. In addition to the innocence scale, they were asked about the number of times they were expelled, suspended, and given detention, and about how many times they were arrested in school. It is expected that white girls would have a low adultification score, while black girls would have a high adultification score. It is expected since black girls have a higher adultification score, they would predict an increase in school punishments as shown in the scattered plot below. And school arrests as shown in the bar graph. This is serious because children who are arrested have difficulty with housing, FAFSA, and job opportunities. In addition, behavior conduct lists are legal documents that stay in the student's file and can be presented in court, which will result in a higher punishment. Overall, adultification bias is serious because if policymakers and teachers have stereotypes of black girls, they're supposed to protect and teach. Their bias will influence how they view and treat the child. Black girls need to be viewed as children and not have their childhood taken from them. To prevent this, more teacher training needs to be done, including critical race theory, stereotypes, and how racism looks in the classroom. Thank you. Thank you, Kayla, great work. Next up, we have Zia Headley. Hey everyone, my name is Zia Headley. I'm working in the Universal Pre-K Lab under Dr. Elise Capella and my mentor, Jessica Siegel. My proposed study is on the impact of parents' mental health literacy on children's mental health and well-being. So there's an issue in the field of mental health, that issue being the treatment gap. As shown in the graph, for both adults and children, the rates of individuals with mental health disorders greatly outnumbers those that are seeking treatment. Previous studies have identified several potential impacting factors, one of which is low levels of mental health literacy. Mental health literacy is defined as knowledge and beliefs about mental health disorders, which aid in their recognition, management, and prevention. Meaning, 
Individuals with low levels of mental health literacy have several misconceptions and misunderstandings regarding mental health disorders and treatment resources, some of which are deeply rooted in public stigma. These misconceptions lead to individuals not getting the treatment they need, but also impacts those that are around them and in their care, looking specifically at the parent-child relationship due to the fact that children rely on their parents to take care of them and their health. These misconceptions parents have ultimately hurt the child as symptoms aren't being identified and resources aren't being sought out. In an effort to raise mental health literacy, previous studies have looked at the benefits of web-based interventions for parents. However, none of them look specifically at the impact for children. Therefore, my proposed research aims to evaluate the impact of a mental health literacy intervention for parents on their mental health literacy, as well as their children's mental health and well-being. My proposed study would take 200 parents and their fifth grade children from 10 elementary schools across New York City. Parents would be asked to complete measures to evaluate their mental health literacy levels, as well as their current habits talking to their children about mental health. Children would be asked to complete inventories on anxiety, depression, disruptive behavior, anger, and self-concept. These measures would be completed at three times, pre-intervention, post-intervention, and at a follow-up when the child reaches eighth grade, which is adolescence where a lot of mental health disorders become most apparent. The control group will get a pamphlet on the parent-child relationship, whereas the intervention group will get eight weekly one-hour sessions with weeks one to six focusing on raising mental health literacy and weeks seven and eight focusing on how to talk to your child about mental health. Both of these sections will include several interactive activities such as games and example situations to check for retention and understanding of the information because those have been proven in previous studies to be the most effective. I expect that the intervention will lead to increases in parents' levels of mental health literacy and that the children in the intervention group will see lower levels of concern regarding their mental health when compared to their counterparts in the control group. There are a couple of limitations to this study. However, the proposed study does reduce, reduce some potential limiting factors by being web-based rather than in-person. Parents are able to complete it at a time that is most convenient for them during the week, as well as the potential reduction for the impact of public stigma as they can complete this in their own home where they're more, most comfortable. The proposed study is unique and it's aimed to identify the benefits of a mental health literacy intervention on both the parents and the children and to see if these effects on the children are longer term. Future studies would take this research and apply these kind of mental health literacy interventions in different contexts in different cultural environments and social environments. I would like to thank Dr. Elise Capella, Jessica Siegel, the Universal Pre-K team and everyone at Quest that has helped me throughout this project. Thank you so much. Thank you, Zia, great work. Next up, we have Jane Otune. Hi, my name is Chinime Jane Otune, and I'm from the Universal Pre-K Lab, where I work under Dr. Elise Capella and Jessica Seo. My research proposal is on a longitudinal examination of a further education program's impact on low-income fathers' involvement with their children. Previous research have shown that low-income fathers are at risk of lower quality parenting due to barriers associated with socioeconomic status. And these findings have led to creating programs designed to encourage further involvement in child rearing practices. And different studies have shown that these programs encourage positive outcomes in both fathers and their children. However, Research have yet to investigate whether such programs have long-term effects. And therefore, the current study seeks to bridge this gap by examining whether a father education program has a long-term effect on father's involvement and subsequently the academic outcome of their children. We decided to focus on academic outcomes since research has shown that children from low-income backgrounds have worse academic outcome on average in comparison to children from middle and high SES background. And so we would like to know if investigating, if we would like to know if investigating the increase of father involvement 
may be one path towards reducing these income-based disparities. To carry out the proposed study, I designed an intervention program with 90 fathers and their pre-K children from six schools across New York City in low-income communities. These six schools will be assigned to either the intervention or the control group. The control group will get education pamphlets on father-child engagement, while participants from the intervention group will attend a nine-week two-hour session every Saturday. This will consist of a 50-minute lecture on parenting skills and partner involvement, a 20-minute table talk on father's views and beliefs about fatherhood, and a 15-minute father-child play. To measure father involvement and children's academic outcome, children will be given the Woodcock-Johnson Test of Achievement, while fathers will be given reports that will measure their responsibility, accessibility, and interaction with their children. These tests will be administered at the beginning and immediately after the program. And to measure the long-term effect of the program, Fathers will participate in a follow-up interview every two years for six years to measure the frequency of their interaction with their children. And children will also take the achievement test at these different follow-up time points. At the end of the study, we expect that participating in an education program will increase fathers' involvement and subsequently the academic outcome of their children and the long term, there will be a sustained increase in both measures. And finally, despite the limitations of this study, conducting it is of importance as it will help future studies and developing programs seeking to increase fathers involvement in interactive activities that are beneficial to children. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Jane, that was great. Next up, we have Justine Mariscal. Good morning, everyone. My name is Justine Mariscal, and I am a part of the Mindful Education Lab. I will be looking into the effect that meditation has on aggression and emotion regulation in adolescents. Aggression is one of the most common behavioral problems in children and adolescents, and in 2019, one in four seventh graders reported being bullied by a classmate. Emotion dysregulation has been shown to predict aggression and other maladaptive behaviors, as well as poor academic performance. Previous research has shown that mindfulness interventions can improve emotion regulation and decrease aggression in elementary and high school students. Our research seeks to replicate this with middle school students and investigate the mediating role of emotion regulation, predicting that mindfulness will decrease aggression by increasing students' ability to regulate their emotions. We will test our hypothesis by working with teachers to add a 20 minute meditation course to the required health course in 30 seventh grade classrooms for middle schools with high suspension rates throughout New York City. There will also be 30 randomly assigned control classrooms that only receive the required health course without the added meditation course. Before the start of the intervention and at the end of the study, students from all 60 classes will complete subjective measures of aggression, emotion regulation, and mindfulness with the latter acting as a manipulation check. Peer reports and classroom observation measures will also be collected and we will be reviewing admin reports on peer conflict and aggression related disciplinary events across the school year. We will be running a two by two ANOVA to show that the intervention classes will improve significantly more than the control classes across all measures. Seventh grade is a critical time in adolescent development to introduce an intervention as the mind is in a period of extraordinary neuroplasticity. At this age, adolescents are easily influenced by their environment which in, emphasizes the importance of creating a space where they can effectively learn how to control their emotions and aggression. 
This is especially important for the population that we will be working with since high suspension rates are correlated with higher populations of low income students of color who are disciplined at higher rates than their white counterparts. Future research should include other forms of meditation as well as a larger, more diverse sample size. I would like to give special thanks to Dr. Barry Cohen, Dr. Joshua Aronson, Michelle Vardanian, Quinesha Critchlow, Deanna Malave, Michaela Hayes, and the entire Quest team for their guidance throughout this project. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Justine. Last but not least, we have Michaela I. Hayes. Good morning, everyone. My name is Michaela Hayes, and I am a part of the Mindful Education Lab, where my research is on the wandering mind, mindful awareness meditation in adult ADHD. Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, also known as ADHD, was originally characterized as a disorder that affected only children. It is now understood that ADHD continues into adulthood for 40 to 60% of those diagnosed in childhood. In addition, as many as 8 million adults have ADHD in the United States. Despite these findings, treatment for adult ADHD continues to be unprioritized in comparison to children and adolescents. The current treatment for ADHD primarily involves pharmacotherapy in which its long-term effects had not been fully investigated. This proposed study challenges the standard of treating mental health disorders by medicine. It'll examine how the regular practice of meditation will affect young adults with ADHD presenting symptoms of executive dysfunction, inattention, and emotional dysregulation. 130 undergraduate students between 18 and 27 years old will be recruited as participants through word of mouth and social media. Students with little to no experience, but a desire to learn and practice regular meditation will be included in the study. A two group by two pre post design will be conducted where the experimental group will receive mindfulness meditation training and the active control group will receive organization and study skills training. Participants will receive a questionnaire on ADHD symptoms and interviewed at the beginning of the study to see if they have any personal goals other than ADHD symptom reduction to track over time. These goals will serve as a motivator for practicing meditation and mindful awareness, increasing the potential reduction of symptoms. Participants will be randomly assigned to the experimental or control group and receive treatment for eight weeks. This will include an hour to an hour and a half workshop twice a week and individual practice of the assigned treatment. Post-intervention, participants will complete the same measures pre-intervention to evaluate changes in their outcomes. A T-test and a two by two mixed design ANOVA will be conducted to determine any significant difference and interaction between the time and treatment factor. The expectation is that before the intervention, ADHD symptoms will be presented at a high rate. It is expected that the meditation intervention will reduce symptoms of executive dysfunction, inattention and emotional dysregulation significantly more than the control intervention. There will be a correlation between the amount of meditation practice and the reduction in ADHD symptoms, such that as practicing meditation increases, ADHD presenting symptoms will decrease. These major findings could be attributable to the mindfulness meditation training components being focused on increasing present attentive awareness that is non-judgmental. Because meditation is usually referred to as mental training, Meditation strengthens cognitive and spatial awareness due to focusing attention on one thing and utilizing it as a foundation. Mindfulness and meditation appears to be a viable alternative that can elevate mood, improve focus and performance without the negative side effects of medication. I wanna give special thanks and gratitude to Dr. Joshua Aronson, Dr. Barry Cohen, Quinesha Critchlow, Diana Malave, Justine Mariscal and the Quest team for their support and guidance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michaela. That was great. And as somebody said, you just you definitely brought it home. So I want to once again thank everybody for attending. I want to thank our amazing presenters and all the hard work you did. It definitely paid off in these presentations. I was fascinated by all of your topics and so much so interested to hear more about you know your work that you've done so what we're going to do now as you see on the screen 
we have breakout rooms for each presenter. So what you need to do is go to the breakout room button and you will be able to join each room. So you can join, for example, Iris's room um, and you can ask some questions, talk about the poster, and then you can leave and come back to the main room and then rejoin another breakout room. Any questions about breakout rooms or how that works? Okay, so then we're going to open up the breakout rooms. Down at the bottom of your screen, it says it should say join a breakout room. You can click on that button and go to the right hand side and, and it'll say join. Anybody have I'm going to pause the recording because it's just going to.